So today I want to start chapter 13. And chapter 13 is kind of a continuation of chapter 12, but it's totally different in the mechanisms. Um, and it involves an introduction of the chi-squared test. Today we're going to do the chi-squared or the chi-square goodness of fit test. And I'll go ahead and say that some calculators do the goodness of fit test and some calculators do not. If the yellow school bus ones do it. Some of the TI-83s and 83 pluses don't. And if your calculator says chi-squared test, that's not the one I'm doing. I'll do that next week. If it says chi-squared GOF, that's goodness of fit, that's what we're doing. But in all honesty, I think doing it on the calculator is a waste of time. I don't do these on the calculator. Now, the ones we'll do next week, I like the calculator for, but I'm not going to do it today. What I want to do to teach you the chi-squared test is use an activity to go through it. And it starts out, basically, I have a whole bunch of dice. I have my students bring them one year for extra credit when we could do that. And they brought me a jillion dice. So it was right before spring break. I didn't know what to do with all these dice. And I was taking them out of their little packages and putting them into my ice cream tub at my in-law's house during spring break. And my father-in-law has a grinder in the garage. So I was looking at the grinder, and I was looking at the dice, and I was looking at the grinder, and I was looking at the dice. And I thought to myself, self, so that's what I did. And I took a corner of the die and shaved it off. So this corner is gone. Now yeah, it's a little bigger than I hoped. There it is. So my die looks like that now. And I did it in the same location on all the dice. It's on the corner that has the one, two, three corner. Now, admittingly, it's just me with the grinder and the dice at my in-laws. So I won't say that I shaved them all off identically, but my intention was to shave off between a go down about a third or a half of each side and shave that corner off. I don't know why. I just did it. What I want to know is what sort of effect that will have on the die. And I don't, of course, I don't know what the right answer because I just did it. But we can think about it and we can speculate if if doing this will will matter. And so basically, there's there's three options that I see. This could have no effect, meaning the way I rolled it before. That shave was going. That shave was there, and the way I do it after is the same. It could make it more likely to get um, one, two, or three, or it could make it less likely to get one, two, or three. And I kind of think it's reasonable to lump one, two, and three together since that's the corner I shaved off. So either that side, one of those sides, is more likely to be up or one of those sides is more likely to be down, or it didn't do anything. Do you all understand the question? And before, I, we're gonna, I'm going to pass out the dice. We're going to roll them a bunch of times and see, because I haven't achieved the statistical all-knowing God status. I don't know what the right answer is. So first, before we get the dice, I want you to think, which one of these do you think is the case? Because it's important first for all of us to, to acknowledge one of these things is correct and the other two are incorrect. I want to go with that. One of these is right. The other two are wrong. There's no other option. How many of you think shaving that corner of the die off would have no effect? Raise your hand. One. One. How many of you think you'd be more likely to get a one, two, or three? You guys are chicken. It's like, uh, you wait, one person raises their hand, and then they'll come up. How many of you think you're less likely to get a one, two, or three? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Good. Now, continuing my discussion from a second ago, it's, it's important to recognize that the one, seven, and nine, that's your judgment. But this is not a subjective problem. This is an objective problem. So... Maybe one of you is correct, maybe seven of you are correct, or maybe nine of you are correct, but the others are necessarily wrong. Follow this? 
in the morning they said, Coach, how much did you shave off? Because I think that'll matter. It might matter to the magnitude of change if there is a change. But it it'll either shaving stuff off either has no effect, it makes it more likely, or it makes it less likely. If you think, for example, it makes it more likely, if I shaved off more, you probably think it makes it even more likely. Do you follow? So shaving more off just changes the magnitude of the effect, if any. At least this is the, the logic that I would go with. So now what I want to do is uh, pass out the die, and we're going to roll it a bunch of times, and see if the data that we get can give us any knowledge. Either just, hey, here's what happened, and I see why I think I now want to stay with what I did, or I want to pick something different, or here's the outcome. And I thought before that it was no effect, but it looks now like it's more likely, or whatever the case is. So we're going to go through and count how many times we get each number for 60 rolls. So everybody keep track of that. We'll collect a little data and see what we think based on our data. All right, Sid, so do yours add up to 60? All right, give me your numbers. We'll use yours for the example. There we go. Okay, so now, what I want you to do now, we had a couple people that were fairly convinced they were right before, and a bunch of others who just kind of thought it was a whim. So now, based on the 60 dice that you've rolled, and you guys can finish if you haven't quite done it, I want to do a revote. So without a persuasive argument, just kind of saying, okay, I thought such and such, here's the way my role went, I still believe such and such, or now I want to change my mind. And you might change your mind because of the data you actually got, or maybe you change your mind because you've thought about it some more, or maybe you see... Here's how that little shaved edge actually affects things was I watch it happen. So now with our with our change here, how many of you think there's no effect? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine people now think it doesn't matter. How many raise it one more time? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven people. Eleven people think it doesn't matter. Okay? That's not a very good 11. All right. How many of you think you're more likely to get a 1, 2, or 3? 4. And how many of you think you're less likely to get 1, 2, 3? All right. Now, again, we would still say that one of these choices is correct and the others are wrong. We would not say that majority rules, although the majority may be correct, we, won't, we don't win because we're the majority. We win because we're right. And it, in this case, we're not going to know who's right because we don't know what the answer is. All we can do is look at the evidence and see what the evidence tells us. Do you guys that think you are more or less likely think that you are way more or way less or just some more or some less? Okay, so if it's just a little bit of a difference then that's, that can be hard to tell. And so since you guys think, th those seven of you who picked there was a change, since those seven of you think the difference wasn't huge, think about this with me. Is it easy for you to believe that somebody else's data gives them an opinion different than yours? So, for example, if you looked at Sid's data, what do you think? Based just on the data that we've got right here, how many of you would say no effect based on this, if you were Sid? Okay, how many of you would say more likely to get a one, two, or three? How many of you would say less likely? Okay, so we all think if this is what we're looking at instead of whatever it is you're looking at, you would go with no effect. But at least seven of you have data that's enough different than hers that you think there is an effect of some sort. And so what we want to do with the chi-squared test is see if we can figure out um, – what the evidence tells us, which one we ought to believe. We're not going to figure out which one's right because that would involve proof and we're not going to find proof. We're just going to look at evidence. The way a chi-squared test works is something where I guess I want you guys to figure out. I want you to, to figure out how we're going to do it. These blue numbers right here are what Sid got. How can we measure 
how weird that is. So I guess the first thing we need to start out with is a null and alternative hypothesis. What's the null hypothesis going to be? There's no difference. The proportions are equal. The null hypothesis is the hypothesis of no change. What we do in chapter 13 is we write the null and alternative hypotheses in sentences instead of in symbols most of the time. So the null hypothesis is, um, I'll write it like this, each outcome is equally likely. The alternative hypothesis is each number is not equally likely. Now, in Chapter 12, what we would have done is found proportions. We could have found the proportions of 1, 2, and 3, the proportions of 4, 5, and 6. We could have done a test of proportions to see if they were like we thought. What we do in Chapter 13 is we can look at lots of proportions all at the same time. So what we're going to do on this problem is look at each number individually. We're going to look at ones, we're going to look at twos, we're going to look at threes, but we can look at them individually all at once. The, there was one other thing I wanted to say uh, to you 11 people who think there's no effect. Consider this game. We roll a die. If it's a one, two, or three, and I convince you to play this game with me. If it's a one, two, or three, you give me 20 bucks. If it's a four, five, or six, I give you 20 bucks. If the die is fair and balanced, we would assume that this game, or we would expect this game to be fair. Meaning, if you and I played 100 times, you ought to win 50 and I win 50. So if, if I convince you to play this game with me, I say, I find you at lunch and I say, hey, I got this game. You want to, let's go. How lucky are you? You say, yeah, I'll play with you. If I pulled out this die with the corner shaved off, you still going to play with me? I'm guessing these 11 people are. Because they think that that shaved corner doesn't mean anything. Now, I don't know what the right answer is, but it just seems hard to believe that the shaved corner doesn't matter. It, it, it's certainly a mental thing when I look at it and I go, it's got to mean something. Now, the question is, in, it's, if a physicist was in here, could they demonstrate to us how it's different? How the, the what is it? the rotational velocity changes or the angular velocity of how you roll it and blah, blah, blah that I don't remember or probably never knew. Um, but <laughs> that's what it is. But And there was an omega in there, wasn't there? I think that's angular velocity. So I don't know, but there's a mental component to this game that I want you to play, but there's a right answer as far as maybe maybe there is really no effect. And so we want to kind of explore that. How can I look at the numbers that Sid gave me and judge how goofy they are? I thought each number would be equally likely. Here's what I got. Do I quit believing each number is equally likely or, or what? How strong is this blue evidence against HO? So how can I measure this? What would you do? Right? So I should get all of them 10 times. If they're 60... 60 rolls, and each roll is equally likely because we assume HO is true until we've got enough evidence to quit believing it, then I would have expected each outcome to give me, or each one to be 10 times. So these are the observed values. This is what Sid actually rolled. What I expected her to get was 10. Now, some of you guys did it a different number than 60, so how do we mathematically come up with 10? It's this number, the 60, divided by 6. And that's why I told you to try to do it in an increment or an interval of six so that these numbers are integers. It'll only help us do the math visually with their integers. It doesn't matter in the, as far as the test is concerned whether they are or not. Christina. Okay. So let's, there they are. There's what I expected, Abby. But what do I do now? Okay, I could do it as proportions. And if I was in Chapter 12, that's exactly what I would do is actually proportions. But in Chapter 13, we don't deal with proportions. We deal with these actual numbers all at once. Kind of the right idea. We did. Uh, she said she felt like before we were talking about groups 1, 2, and 3 and group of 4, 5, and 6, and now I'm talking about them separately. I am talking about them separately because I can do the chi-squared test that way. 
Um, so most of you would probably, I think, if I showed you this die, you might not think that one was the same as six, but I think most of us would think one is the same as two, and two is the same as three. And maybe the other side is the same as those three, or maybe it's something different. I don't know. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so she says Lou, the average difference. So let's start with difference. And this column here, then I'll do the difference. So this is going to be negative 4. So if I do observed minus expected, that's negative 4, negative 2, 5, negative 1, negative 2, and 4. And so Abby wants me to do the average difference. So if I do the average difference, the way to do the average is to add up the differences and divide by 6, right? So let's add up the differences. So why square them? Do you think that this equals zero because I concocted the problem and set Sid up as a plant to give me the numbers that would make it work? Or do you think that's just the way it is? Why? Why is that the way it is? That is the way the cookie crumbles, but why? Is that what you were going to tell me? So why? It's like the mean. Yeah, exactly. It's not the mean, but it's like the mean. Because when we said mean, you remember way back in Chapter 7, gosh, it seems like ages ago, I told you that mean was the same thing as expected value. Remember that? This is the expected value. So it's very similar to the mean. Those, those are a comparable idea. So when I find out how far these are from the expected, the sum of that is going to be zero. So I do something akin to the variance. i got to square all these things, as was said a second ago. So now let's square all these. So if I square all these numbers, this is 16, 4, 25, 1, 4, and 16. And if I add those up, then I ought to just be able to take the zero here and square it, and that will be the sum of that column, right? No, it doesn't work like that. So i got to add up the column. That's 20, 40, 50, 66. I think the sum there is 66. Somebody can verify that for me. So 66 is a measure of how wrong I was. I don't know 66 what, but it's a measure of how wrong I was. What would, what would a smaller number there mean? Less wrong, less closer to the right thing. So now we got to think about this deal. Is 66 way wrong or not very wrong? So we got to figure out what to compare it to, and it's kind of like a margin of error, but it's something more like you did in chemistry. Sort of like a percent error, exactly. So let me ask you this. This is a theoretical, and those kind of blow your mind, especially if it was, say, multiple choice. In first and second period, I made them roll them 120 times. Okay. What do you think this this sum of the errors squared was for their class? So think about this, because this is this is a conundrum wrapped in a riddle with an enigma on the side. If you flip a coin a bunch of times, like a whole bunch of times, what do you expect the proportion of heads to be? 50-50, because the law of large numbers says it gets closer to the real deal, right? On the other hand, if I flip a coin three times and I get three heads, are you, like, really impressed with yourself? I mean, it's kind of weird. You got three heads in a row, but, I mean, I, <laughs> I probably couldn't do it again. But if I flipped a coin a hundred times and I got a hundred heads in a row, that would be really weird, because I've done it so many times. So you had a brainstorm, and aha. That it's really wrong. That's good. Yes. So here's another way to think about it. Assume I only told you to roll the die six times. you got to follow my line of thinking here because it's got some mental steps. If I only had you roll it six times, how many ones, twos, threes, how many would you expect each one? One. What is the, the wrongest I could be? If I rolled all six ones. That's the most out of whack it could possibly Six of the same number. That's the most out of whack it could be. 
So what would the square of the error be for that one that I rolled six times? It'd be, I observed six, I thought I'd get one, so I had an error of five squared is 25. What would the error be for the rest of them? The rest of them, I got how many? I got zero. I expected one. Zero minus one. I get the negative one squared is one. So I got one, two, three, four, five, plus the 25. The wrongest I could be is 30. You see what I mean? I couldn't get a number bigger than 30. Well, here I've already got 66. Why? Because I rolled it more than six times. I rolled it a bunch of times. So we've got to figure out how to handle this 66 because there's a couple of things that matter that are affecting that 66. Here's another thing that affects it. Earlier, Christina said I should have continued like I did before in group one, two, and three, and group four, five, and six. Okay, fine. How many one, two, and threes do we have? 29? 31? I would have expected 30 and 30, right? How wrong am I now? Not very wrong at all. So the number of groups I have over here also matters. You guys following this? So we've got to figure out what to do with this 66 to sort of account for those magnitude changes. Now, you could figure out the wrongest. It's hard for you to even say wrongest, isn't it? You could figure out what the wrongest is and go from there, or we can end up doing something kind of like percent error, which is a similar deal because in a percent error, you get the percentage idea. Right. So, right, two great points. So you're, you found that your difference, although it wasn't, perfectly evenly split it wasn't so whacked that you're going well wow, something's going on here and you don't think we did it very many times while you might not have wanted to roll the die 120 times you would at least recognize that's better than 60 so what coach Pryor is going to do is pass around a sheet of paper in a minute and you're going to write down how many you got of everything and i'm going to combine that with first second and third period and i'm going to combine that with 2010 and 2009 and 2011 and 2008 and 2007 and 2006 because I think I've done it about five or six years and I'll come back with a sample size of 15,000 rolls and we'll all say now we're not going to tell you the truth but that's going to provide lots of evidence against HO and we can weigh all that evidence and decide if it's uh, going to give me a small p value to reject HO or a big p value what we end up doing in this chapter if we reject HO and we decide they're not equally likely at that point we go back and we say why did I get more of this number than I thought or less of this number than I thought so in this chapter all of the HAs are kind of like this two-sided idea it's sort of like this if I went on a, um, a fitness program I'm going to do a fitness program for six weeks what's my null hype and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to measure my weight as one of the components of this what would you say my null hypothesis is? The way it doesn't change. The null hypothesis is the hypothesis of no change. In this chapter, what's the alternative? The weight does not not change, meaning the weight changes, right? Because what that covers is me losing weight because I lost some body fat or me gaining weight because I gained some muscle mass. And so what we would do is, is test that out. If we rejected the idea that my weight stayed the same and decided it changed, then we would say, did it change because I gained weight or changed because I lost weight? So here's what we're going to do with our dice problem. We're going to take these numbers here and we're going to divide all of them. Let's see if I can perhaps move this. This is cool. Group it. Move it down here. Give me some more room. We're going to take all of these observed minus expected squareds, and we're going to divide them by the expected to see this, this first number, for example, was 16 square units wrong divided by an expected 10 total values there. So this is going to be 16 over 10, 4 over 10, 25 over 10, 1 over 10, 4 over 10, 16 over 10. So to sum up that row... Can I just take this 66 over 10? Yeah, you actually can there. So the sum here is 66 over 10 
which is obviously 6.6. .6. This number, 6.6, .6, is something called the chi-squared test statistic. This is the new test. Along with the new test, you'll get a new chart tomorrow. So let's look at this chart, and I'll give you one tomorrow. This is in your book. It's uh, also on the website that you're welcome to look at. The chi-squared distribution is always right squared. So this area that's shaded here is the p-value. The, the graph looks one-sided, but it goes with what appeared to be a two-sided HA. That's the way this is in Chapter 13. So all of them will always look like this. And uh, we're going to look for our p-value here on this table. But we notice that, aha, there's degrees of freedom. So we've got to go back and talk about degrees of freedom for just a second. What's the definition of degrees of freedom? How many you need to know before you know everything? So thinking about that with this problem, what do you think the degrees of freedom are? Five. Why five? That's great, Raquel. How come? Good. So we know I gave you the instruction to roll it 60 times. So whatever number you didn't know, let's say your water spilled on it and one of the numbers smudged, it's whatever number you need to get to get 60. Or perhaps looking at it a different way, you knew the sum of the errors was zero. So which, what does the error have to be to make the rest of the column add up to zero? Once you knew what the error was, you could figure out what the original value is. So for, for chi-squared, or at least for this part of the book, the degrees of freedom are the categories minus 1. So the categories minus 1, that's 6 minus 1, that's 5. So I go back to my chart. I look at five degrees of freedom. I'm going to slide over until I find my test statistic, which was 6.6. .6, and I realize my p-value is bigger than 0.25. Make it a little bigger if you can't see it. So my p-value is bigger than 0.25, which tells me to do what? Not reject. So my data does not give me enough evidence to reject HO. I continue to think the die is balanced, even with a corner shaved off. Now, Ashley says maybe we should do it more times. But this is an important thing. The p-value accounts for the sample size. Doing it more times may help us make sure that our answer is not weird. And that's a good thing. But the p-value does account for the sample size. So tomorrow when you come to class, I'll give you all the data for all the classes, and we'll run through the same thing with a much larger sample size. And it, how could you do this with bigger numbers easily? Shove them in your list. Put your observes in your list. Put your expecteds in your list. Subtract and square. Divide. Add them up. It's easy. Y'all have a great day, and I'll see you tomorrow.